Hello everybody, this is the fourth and last video for chapter three of the statistical learning course. So uh, in the previous video, we've started discussing shrinkage method, methods which could be uh, seen as uh, regression methods where you apply a penalty or some form of pressure to shrink the magnitude of uh, the parameters and coefficients in their regression model and the the reason why this was done is to try to remove the variance or to reduce the variance of uh, par parameters and therefore the variance of predictions because we saw earlier that the mean square error of prediction for new observations is the uh, the variance of prediction plus the bias square plus the irreducible error term. So if we shrink the variance uh, and, the, and the, the bias does not increase too much, then we should be able to achieve better uh, prediction to smaller uh, MSC for new observations. So in the, um, the, uh, the, the previous video, we've introduced the ridge regression, which entailed uh, first imposing a penalty on parameters during the, esti uh, the estimation procedure for parameters. And then we were able to solve this uh, new optimization problem in closed form to get the solution. And finally, we saw that this ridge regression problem could be interpreted in a second way, which was equivalent, which was to, um, to, to in instead of applying a penalty on the parameters, we could instead apply a constraint on parameters by uh, constraining the, the sum of squared parameters. And we saw that both formulations are equivalent because up to some mapping between the, the constant driving the constraint or the constant driving the penalty, there's a correspondence between the solution of both problems. So that's great. But uh, what we saw last time is that rich regression do not provide uh, parsimonious models in the sense that ridge regressions shrink the magnitude of parameters, but it doesn't set them to zero exactly. So the, the, if there, there are, um, let's say, 100 uh, predictors in a regular regression, then applying a ridge regression will still keep the 100 predictors, but it will shrink their coefficients to try to reduce noise. So what we will do here uh, in this video is to introduce the lasso, which is a, a shrinkage method which combines feature of both uh, predictor selections and uh, shrinkage methods or shrinking the parameter magnitude. Okay, so we'll start by discussing this method now. So the lasso is a recent alternative to ridge, re ridge regression, which uh, attempts to overcome the lack of parsimony provided by estimated model with the ridge regression. So what differentiates the lasso from a ridge regression is the following. It's the shape of the penalty we impose on the parameters. Okay, so for a linear model, so for a lasso, we still use the same uh, linear model that we was er, used earlier, but now in the estimation step, the estimation of parameters are uh, is done through finding the step of betas, so intercept and slopes, which minimize the sum of squared errors, sum of squared prediction errors in the training set. So this is the objective function for the OLS, plus once again a penalty on parameters, but here this time. Uh, the penalty has the form lambda times the sum across all uh, predictive variables of the absolute value of beta. So this is different from what we had earlier. For the ridge, this was squared, whereas here, instead of being beta j squared, it's absolute value of beta. So the shape of penalty changes. So just looking at that, we might think that this change is somewhat minor and should not have a very large impact on the solution, but we're going to see that indeed there's, uh, there will be something conceptually different with the solution that did not occur with uh, the ridge regression. 
Okay, so now before we we discuss this um, this outcome, once again there's this parameter lambda that needs to be estimated in practice. So um, uh, to, to do that, once again, we can proceed as for the ridge regression. We can uh, try several values of lambda and compare their out-of-sample predictive performance for val various values of lambda and then pick the lambda which gives the best uh, validation MSE. Okay, so this, uh, doing that in this way to find out-of-sample bold prediction accuracy and then find lambda which minimizes such accuracy it attempts to find the suitable trade-off of shrinkage to apply so as to obtain uh, the best prediction accuracy out of sample for completely new observations that are different from the training set okay so let's uh, let's discuss the solution of a lasso regression so first, let's define once again, beta star is the column vector of all betas except beta zero. Okay, so this includes all the slopes of the linear model. And then we're going to uh, consider the lasso penalty. So uh, as we uh, discussed in the previous slide, in the lasso, the penalty has this form. So it's lambda times the sum across all explanatory variables of uh, absolute value of beta j where j is the, the the predictor and this quantity here it's known as uh, it's often written as the norm of the vector beta star so beta star is the vector which contains all such pattern, uh, parameters beta j and here the norm here we write l1 here because this is known as an l1 norm okay so what do we mean by a l1 norm so if uh, for those who did some metric space theory, uh, for instance, then you might know that the LQ norm of a vector is defined as uh, the, 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 the sum across all elements of the vectors uh, of the element in absolute value to the power Q and all of this to the power, power uh, 1 divided by Q. Okay, so here, if, L, uh, if Q is equal to 1, then the L1 norm because becomes simply the sum of absolute values. Whereas here, if you have the L2 norm, the L2 norm is the sum of squared beta with the square root of all this. Okay, so we see that the lasso penalty is the lambda times the L1 norm of the uh, vector, uh, the parameter vector. Whereas in the ridge regression we had earlier, the penalty was of this form, the uh, lambda times the sum of beta squared. So it's the L2 norm of the be uh, vector beta that is squared. Okay, because the square root here, if we want to remove it, you, if we square that, the square root just disappears. Okay, so we see that the lasso regression replaces the L2 norm for the penalty term by an L1 norm on the parameter vector. Okay, so one. Um, Unfortunate feature of lasso regressions is they typically cannot be solved in closed form. So most of the time uh, we need to resort to numerical algorithms to, uh, to solve the lasso regression problem or find the vector of betas minimizing the lasso objective function. This explains why uh, lasso is a more recent development than ridge regression where ridge regression could be fine it's close form so numerically it's more, much more convenient to compute. So if you want to do a lasso regression with R you can use the, the function GLM net which is explained in the textbook. Okay so once again because um, in the lasso regression there's some penalty on the magnitude of parameters then this is a shrinkage method also so that parameters are shrunk towards zero in comparison to the unconstrained OLS regression. But uh, there's a key difference uh, between lasso and ridge. Ridge regressions uh, do not force parameters to zero. Okay, The parameters remain uh, non-null but their magnitude is uh, shrunk. Conversely for the lasso, if you uh, put 
sufficiently large lambda. So if lambda is large enough, then the penalty will lar be large enough. And gradually, as you increase lambda, the lasso regression will impose that the sum of the betas become exactly zero. So it forces some parameters to drop or predictive variables to drop from the regression model when you increase lambda. Okay, so this is a very interesting feature of lasso because lasso typically uh, can provide sparse models, which means that you have less predictors that remain in the predictive model than the total number of predictors you have in your database and that you use in your regression. Okay, so this is very positive because the models uh, obtained through lasso regressions can be simpler to interpret than ridge regression uh, models because uh, in the final solution, uh, if you have a sufficiently large lambda, then you'll get less uh, non-null parameters, so your model will have less predictive variables and less variables make it more simple to interpret. So this is a very interesting feature of lasso regression. So if you are interested in model interpretability and you want to drop, uh, completely drop unnecessary parameters instead of sim simply uh, shrinking their, their betas, then you might be interested in applying a lasso regression. Okay, so once again, there's this kind of dual problem for uh, lasso regression. So we said for Ridge that there, there were two equivalent problems. Either one where you constrain, you um, put a penalty on parameters or a second one where you constrain parameters and you have the same type of result for lasso regressions. So the first lasso regression we had is uh, kind of a regression where you had an L1 penalty on the parameter vector. Whereas here we can uh, define a new problem where you have instead a constraint on the L1 norm of the parameter vector and once again there's this equivalence of solution between the two problems. So you can either constrain uh, parameters or you can impose a penalty on parameters and you, uh, the solutions from both problems will be equivalent. Okay so here uh, once again uh, the, for this dual problem you can show that for any lambda in the lasso regression you f can find a corresponding positive number s such that the solution of the original lasso problem is also the solution of this dual problem here which is uh, to find a set of betas which minimize the sum of squared prediction errors in sample once again subject to the following constraint which is constraint which is that the l1 norm of the uh, the parameter vector beta is smaller or equal to s and here I say beta but it should be beta star because here once again the intercept j is equal to zero is not included in that constraint for the same reasons that we've discussed in the previous video. Okay so now uh, that's a bit uh, curious so why is that the case that ridge regressions do not drop predictors but lasso regressions do. So what happens for uh, this kind of different, uh, conceptually different outcome from both regressions? How can we explain that? We'll provide a bit of intuition about that uh, visually in the next few slides. Okay, so recall that both the lasso and the ridge regressions, they involve solving a problem which has this form so they try to find the betas which minimize this guy is the sum of uh, prediction errors in sample so this is the prediction error uh, this is the prediction error vector once again so the vector transpose times this it's the sum of squared prediction errors subject to some budget where the budget was a, a constraint on the L2 norm for for of the parameter vector beta star for the ridge regression or the L1 norm of the parameter vector beta star for lasso. Okay. And furthermore, in what follows, again, once again, let's assume that beta zero, it's always uh, chosen optimally. So, uh, and what do we mean by that? We mean that 
beta zero, let's assume that it always solved uh, this problem. So once we select all the other betas, then beta zero is chosen optimally as a function of these other betas to minimize the sum of squared errors. Okay, so we'll study what happens to when we uh, vary all the betas except beta zero, where beta zero, we're going to assume it's always optimally chosen as a function of other betas. So then uh, what happens here, let's go back let, here, let's consider this quantity, the sum of squared errors. We can define the following set, the set of beta 1 until beta p, such that the sum of squared errors is equal to some constant c, and where once again, beta 0, it's uh, defined as its optimal value just fine here. So here, if you have uh, this, the set of betas which solve this defines an ellipsoid in RP. Okay, so why is that the case? Why is it an ellipse or an ellipse in a higher dimension? It's because this is a quadratic equation. Okay, so if you go back to your calculus class, for instance, we've seen that these quadratic equations uh, define regions for beta which correspond to ellipses. Okay. Moreover, so this is for the uh, when to what happens to the betas when we equate the sum of square errors to some constant c. Okay, so of course, if c is too small, this set will contain no parameters because you cannot minimize all errors to zero. But for errors larger than the minimal error, uh, for many values, you will have a solution to this. Okay and probably all values so if you so if c is larger than the minimum probably all values are, are attainable here okay now for the constraints on parameters uh, in the ridge regression the following uh, constraint on parameters sum of squared beta j's uh, being smaller than s this defines a hypersphere of radius square root of s in RP. Okay, so uh, maybe to visualize things, it might be simpler to do either R2 or R3. So in R2, it's going to be a circle, uh, where, whereas in R3, it's going to be a sphere. Conversely, the region characterized by the constraint here, so for a given S, if you find all the betas where the sum of their absolute values is smaller than uh, S, in RP, it defines a polytope. Okay, so it's this is multi-generalized, multi-dimensional uh, generalization of some polyhedron. But what do we mean by that? So again, these are complicated terms, but you might think of them as diamonds. So if you are in R2, then this is some diamond. Uh, and we're gonna see an example next. Okay, so. Uh, okay, before that, I'll just skip one slide. I'll, I'll illustrate explanations with figures here. Okay, so let's uh, study a two-dimensional case. Okay, so in RP, it's the same thing happening, but to make things more visual, let's consider R2. So let's assume we have only two predictive variables, uh, X1 and X2, here associated with uh, slopes beta 1 and beta 2. Okay, so what we're going to plot in the next figure are the following. So the black dots will be the optimal betas obtained from a regular OLS regression, where here the OLS regression puts no constraint on parameters. Blue regions that we're going to plot will be admissible values for beta 1 and beta 2 under the computational budget. So for a fixed S, what are the values of beta 1 and beta 2 that are feasible. And then uh, we're also going to plot red ellipsoids, which are regions of the following form. So each red ellipsoid will be of the form, uh, uh, will be characterized by the following set. So it's the set of all possible betas such that the sum of squared error is given to, is uh, exactly equal to a, some given constant. Okay, so here this is the plot. Once again, I haven't plotted this figure myself. I just borrowed that from the ISL text, textbook. Uh, 
thanks a lot uh, for the authors to uh, author authorizing using their figures. So here, what do we see? So let's say we have a fictitious data set, then probably the optimal uh, beta hat would be at this point. Okay, so again, this is a f like fictitious value. But now what happens here, here on the right side, it's the ridge regression, and on the left side, it's gonna be the lasso. Okay, so here, we if we go back, we said that constraints for uh, ridge regression provide regions of the form of a sphere, okay? So, or a, like a circle in two dimension. Okay, so here the sum of all, uh, not the sum, but the set of all betas such that their L2 norm is smaller or equal to a constant, it defines a sphere, okay? So for a given fixed value of S, in blue uh, we have all the betas that would be admissible by the problem. Conversely, if we fix the, uh, or we, if we constrain the L1 norm of parameters, such as in the lasso regression, so maybe let's rewrite the constraint. So for, okay, so this is lasso. This is a ridge. Ridge. Okay, so here, uh, what we have was that the constraint was the sum of absolute value of beta j's being smaller or equal to s. Okay, so if we're in two dimension, and if uh, you, you, you try to find all betas which satisfy this constraint, then if, you, if the value here is s, if the value here is s, you obtain something like that. Okay, so the admissible values for beta would be found in this, um, this diamond here. Whereas here for the ridge regression, the constraint was the sum of beta j squared being smaller or equal to s. So this defines a sphere like this. Okay, and then what are the red ellipsoids here? The red ellipsoids are, so for one ellipsoid, all the values of betas on this that ellipsoid give the same squared prediction errors. Okay, same sum of squared prediction errors or same average of squared prediction errors. Okay, so we can see that the smallest possible ellipsoid would be a single point beta, which gives the smallest possible uh, sum of squared errors. But here, as you go from here to here, so all, all betas uh, in this ellipsoid, they are equally good in terms of sum of prediction errors. Okay, but here, if you go to the next one, all such betas are equally good in terms of prediction, but the ones from the smaller ellipsoid are better than the one from this larger ellipsoid, and these uh, the betas from this ellipsoid are still better than the ones from the bigger ellipsoid. Okay, so as your ellipsoid becomes bigger, you have uh, worse and worse solutions in terms of uh, prediction errors. So what happens here to find the solution of the uh, ridge or the lasso regression, what you're trying to do is to find the smallest possible ellipsoid which intersects with the blue region. Okay, so you want, so for small ellipsoids, prediction errors are small. Okay, so you want to find the ellipsoid that is all, as small as possible to get prediction errors that are as good as possible, but you still want the ellipsoid to um, touch the uh, region of admissible values because all betas outside the blue region, they're not a solution to the optimization problem because they do not meet the constraints. Okay, so you want, you want to find betas which do meet the constraints, so do fall in that blue region, but yields the best possible error, so you want the ellipsoid as small as possible. So that smallest possible ellipsoid, which touches uh, the, 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 the blue region, are provided for both cases here and here. So here, this is the lasso ellipsoid, which uh, touches here, and here this is the ridge ellipsoid, so the smallest ellipsoid which touches the blue region is this one. And what we see here, maybe I'll just remove the annotations here. Uh, 
So we see that the edges of the diamond are very sharp. And because of that, we see that the intersection between the smallest possible ellipsoid and the blue region happens exactly at beta 1 is equal to 0. Okay, so it's exactly on the axis that we have the intersection. And why is that the case? Well, it's because the edges of the diamond are much sharper than for the circle. So for the circle, the interception, uh, the intersection, sorry, does not happen exactly on the axis, but happens somewhere here where none of the betas are zero. Okay, so you can see using that, that uh, the optimal solution in a lasso here would entail setting beta one exactly to zero, whereas here the optimal solution here and here would entail having both beta one and beta two being different than zero. Okay, so here we really see uh, with this visual interpretation why uh, lasso sets uh, sets some parameters to zero if you have sufficient penalty. This is because the edges of a diamond are much sharper than the well the edges of a circle. There's no edge, but uh, you, you have uh, I don't know how to say that, but if it had edges, it wouldn't be very sharp. Okay, so the intersection happens exactly on uh, axes for the lasso, whereas for the circles, this is not what's happening. Oops. Okay. So this is exactly repeating what I just said. So if what I said in words is not very clear, please uh, take the time to read all this. But I won't go through this again because this is exactly what I just said in the previous slide. Okay. That's very good. So we've seen two possible uh, ways of, or two equivalent ways of performing either ridge regression or a lasso regression. The first uh, approach was to see the, let's say I'll take ridge regression, but it can be lasso also. The ridge as a problem of minimizing squared errors plus some penalty on parameters. The second one was to see the ridge regression as a solution of minimizing squared errors where parameters are constrained. And now we're going to see a third way to uh, understand both ridge regressions and lasso regression through Bayesian statistics. Okay, so I might, I, I'm aware that maybe not all of you have done a um, uh, like a full-fledged Bayesian statistics course, but I hope most of you were already exposed at least slightly to this material, but otherwise I'll just do a quick uh, recap of the important notions for the to understand what happens here. Okay, so what we're going to do now is to uh, see how we can understand ridge regressions and lasso regressions through a Bayesian lens. So in statistics, we can often categorize the various methods into two main um, approaches. The traditional approach, which is also called a frequentist approach in their regression, assumes that the vector of parameters are deterministic but unknown values. Conversely, there's also uh, another approach, which is called the Bayesian approach, which assumes instead that the parameters are random variables and when you observe data you've uh, observed only one instance of such vector of parameters. Okay so two different uh, approaches to statistics when you do a regression frequent frequentist regressions where parameters are assumed to be constant but unknown and the Bayesian approach where parameters are assumed to be random. So in a Bayesian approach, what is assumed when you observe some data, you assume that uh, parameters were uh, not only uh, the responses, but the parameters also were drawn randomly from uh, their unconditional distribution, uh, which will denote by P. So here P beta will uh, refer to the density of uh, the betas. And this density, it's 0.0. 
it's called the prior distribution of bitters. So here, uh, the assumption in Bayes and statistics is when we observe predictors and responses, we assume that uh, the, pre the response was simulated or generated by this model. Okay, once again, an intercept plus a linear combination of predictors plus a noise term. But now, uh, for all observations, there was one realization of the parameters uh, drawn from the unconditional distribution. Okay, so all the same, all sorry, all the observations share the same beta, but this beta, uh, these set of betas at least w was uh, simulated randomly from some prior distribution p of beta. Okay, and moreover, when we have multiple data sets, let's say a training set, uh, um, uh, validation set or, or a test set, we assume that once again, this uh, the, the beta that will be found in these new sets will be the same. Or at, will be the same or maybe I was insufficiently clear or at least drawn from the same distribution. Okay, no, sorry. Not the same distribution will be exactly the same. Okay, so if you have multiple sets, then betas from the training set and the validation set uh, sh should be exactly the same. Sorry for this uh, ambiguity. Okay, so the objective in a Bayesian statistic uh, differs a bit from the objective in a frequentist approach. So for a frequentist approach, you use the data and you try to determine what was the suitable, uh, what was the, what are the unknown values of betas. Conversely, when you have a Bayesian approach, you try to find uh, what was the value of beta, which was sampled from the prior distribution. Okay, so how it's done in practice, as uh, data are generated, so when you observe your data, this will provide you some information about the, the betas that were used for from generating the model. So what we're going to try to compute in a Bayesian setting is the following uh, distribution. We'll often want to find the conditional distribution of the betas given the uh, responses and predictors which were uh, observed in the data set. Okay, so typically the posterior distribution should be much more concentrated around the uh, unknown beta values that were uh, sampled to generate the data set. Uh, instead of the prior distribution. So if we do a quick plot here, so let's say this is the distribution. So maybe let's say this is the prior. And here, the posterior. So again, the, maybe I didn't say it, but the posterior distribution is the conditional distribution of beta given uh, the observed data set y and x. So the posterior distribution should give better information about what was the sample value of beta. So here the blue one is uh, the posterior. So typically uh, the prior distribution um, does not tell you a, a lot of information about what betas could be sampled, but the idea is once you observe some data set, based on this data set, you should have a much better idea of what the values of, what reasonable values of beta could be. Uh, and by reasonable, we mean what was reasonably the value of beta that was used to generate your data set. Okay, so the idea here uh, is to, ha we we like the posterior distribution to be as concentrated as possible around the single value of betas that was uh, randomly uh, selected to generate your observations. Okay. So um, first, we will discuss likelihood. So if you do a 
uh, frequent this approach. Well, regressions, you can compute them uh, through uh, OLS, but there are also other methods to compute uh, regression parameters. One, another one of them is through maximum likelihood. So you can assume that the responses have a given distribution, and based on that distribution, you can apply maximum likelihood to find values of parameters. So if you've done a linear regression class, uh, course, you know that the OLS uh, betas are exactly the same than ma maximum likelihood betas if you assume that the observations are IID, well, not IID, but the, the, they're independent and normally distributed with all the same variants and their mean uh, being driven by the linear model. Okay, so this is, I won't recall precisely this result, but this is well-known theory from a regression class. Okay, so here in classic uh, statistics, the likelihood of the data uh, is given by the following quantity. So it's given by, uh, denoted by F of Y given X and beta, where here in, in the classic theory, the beta uh, is fixed. Okay, so conditioning with respect to beta does not necessarily make sense. Uh, but here we're just use this gonna use this abuse of notation to denote that this likelihood is a function of beta. Here. Okay, so uh, if you define the vector of all responses in your uh, data set, beta as the vector of all parameters from in the regression, including the intercept. So beta star did not include the intercept, but beta does include the intercept. And once again, X is the design matrix for your regression where uh, the i row and the jth column correspond to the, um, the uh, i. So I have to be careful here. I, th I, mean, I throw means i th observation, but j row means j minus one predictor. Okay, where predictor zero refers to uh, exactly a one which corresponds to the intercept. Okay, so here, so if you have this model, linear model, in a classic frequentist approach, you have that the joint distribution of all observations y in your data follows a multivariate normal distribution where uh, the, the mean of this vector y, it's x beta. So th this uh, quantity here means that for each i, the mean is given by uh, this expression here. So this is the mean for all observations i. If you stack that into a vector uh, matrix or a vector, you, you, you get this uh, kind of thing. And here the covariance matrix of y because we assume that observations are independent in the sense that the, the, the epsilons are independent and the x's, let's say we can have them fixed, then uh, the, the, their covariance matrix will be sigma square, which is the variance of the noise vector, variance of epsilon, times the identity matrix because we assume that all observations are independent, so off diagonal it's just a zero. So this gives the classic likelihood, and we're gonna need that classic likelihood to compute the posterior distribution as we're going to see next. Okay, but for a regular linear regression in the standard context, then the likelihood uh, of your model will be uh, the following distribution. So it's a joint uh, multivariate normal distribution with mean vector x beta and a covariance matrix sigma squared times the identity matrix. Okay, so here are uh, assumptions that are commonly applied in Bayesian statistics. So what we're gonna assume here is that the slopes beta are independent from the predictors. Okay, so often in Bayesian statistics, we can assume that not only the betas, but the predictors can also be random variables. But here we're gonna assume, which is standard in Bayesian statistics, that the betas are generated independently from the predictors. So as we said in a Bayesian framework, uh, 
we're interested in uh, determining the posterior distribution of parameters given uh, the information provided by our data set, so predictors and the responses. So here, if we do, do that, we can use a conditioning rule. So there's a rule in probability, which is f of x. Oh, I shouldn't use x, but let's say a or triangle given square is equal to f triangle n squared given by f squared. Okay, so triangle and square, you can think of them as uh, variables. Okay, so here, uh, if you do that, you can add another uh, variable on the right side, let's say circle. Here you can have, uh, whoops, condition on circle, condition on circle here. So if you apply that, then you have that the conditional distribution of betas given y and x it's the joint distribution, so we can place the y on this side. Joint distribution of beta and y, given x, so you still conditional x, given, divided by the conditional distribution of y given x. Okay, so here, uh, what you have is to go from here to here, you decompose this guy here by this. So the joint distribution of beta and y, it's the marginal distribution of y given, uh, given sorry, the conditional distribution of y given beta times the marginal distribution of beta. Okay, so this is well-known uh, result from your uh, prob class. But now, once again, all the distribution, we still keep conditioning with respect to x. Okay. So here, to go from here to here, we simply use the assumption above. So this distribution of betas given x, we assume that x and betas were simulated independently. So this is just p of beta. And then to go from here to here, this sign means proportional. And proportional, in our case, means that the denominator will not depend on beta. Okay, so what's going to happen when we're where we'll want to to maximize with respect uh, to, sorry, if we want to find the betas, which maximize the posterior distribution, then maximizing this quantity or only the numerator will lead to the same betas because the denominator just doesn't depend on beta. So when we try to optimize this with respect to beta, we can just pick the numerator and optimize this. And here, can we interpret this? Well, this is the classic likelihood that we uh, discussed in the previous uh, slide and this is the marginal distribution of the betas. Okay, so we can express the posterior distribution of the betas as the likelihood as something proportional to the likelihood times the prior. Okay. So when uh, in a Bayesian setting, uh, often when we make predictions, we, we can have two approaches. Well, there might be other approaches, but there are two very common approaches. The first one is to, when we make predictions, we will use the betas that are the most likely according to the posterior distribution. Okay, so beta hat, where uh, these are used to make predictions, are the ones which maximize the posterior distribution. And as we saw in the previous slide, this is equivalent to maximizing the likelihood times the prior distribution. Conversely, uh, another possible approach is to use beta as being its expected value uh, based on the posterior distribution. So here beta could be uh, used for prediction could be decided to uh, we could decide to use instead the conditional expectation of beta with respect to the observed data. Okay so both are feasible but using the second one is much more uh, involved in practice except for very special cases but for general cases this is much more involved 
because recall that this is the posterior and we said the posterior is proportional to this so likelihood times prior but at the denominator here we said uh, proportional but at the denominator there was still another quantity here so this distribution if you want to have the conditional expectation you need to compute this guy whereas if you only need the conditional mode you can disregard this guy and typically this guy here f of y given x it's very hard to compute in practice except if you're in very specific cases okay but in practice getting this is a uh, con complicated you need advanced numerical methods to do that so in practice it's often more simple to use the the mode of the posterior distribution uh, as values for beta used for prediction okay good so here this is was a like short summary of prediction methods based on bayesian statistics a okay, very brief introduction so now let's assume we still have the con the same conditional model on beta okay so uh, on responses so we can still assume the same linear model we had uh, in the frequentist approach where we can assume given um, x and beta the vector of y's of responses is multivariate normal with mean vector x beta so this is again the same linear model we have and same variance here so what we um, so now what we need to do if we fully want to specify our Bayesian model we have the likelihood here characterized by this but we also need a prior distribution for the betas because if we we are in here let's say to find the suitable betas for prediction we have to maximize the likelihood which is what we just specified times the prior distribution and different choices of prior distribution will generate different values for beta hat so it can be shown that if you use the following prior so if you use that beta star is generated according to a multivariate normal with zero mean and variance uh, determined by this so sigma square over lambda times the identity matrix and let's assume that beta zero was generated according to this rule so it's y hat sorry y bar minus the uh, some linear combinations of the x bar j then it can be shown that if you use this prior for the betas and this for this relationship for the likelihood then the resulting betas being the mode of the posterior distribution are the ridge regression estimators okay so uh, one quick note here in that case so when you use the normal prior it can be shown that the posterior distribution will also be gaussian okay so for general cases postulating the prior from the postulator prior it's very hard to know what's going to be the posterior distribution but in this specific case uh, where the the betas are normal in the prior it can be shown that the posterior distribution is also a gaussian distribution and because of that both the mode and the mean of the uh, the posterior distribution they're the same so for the gaussian distribution the mean the mode uh, correspond to each other which both correspond to the ridge regression estimate now uh, how do we show that well this is uh, in the exercises so we won't provide the proof here but please go through this because first it's very interesting uh, it's a lot of good learning and it allows you to uh, familiarize yourself with Bayesian statistics if you haven't uh, been exposed to this before okay so this is a pretty interesting exercise if for the first time it's very hard feel free to look at the solution first and then after a few days uh, maybe retry the the exercise again without looking at the solution so you can try to read the right the steps yourself okay so this was for the ridge so when you postulate normal distributions 
a normal distribution for the betas where uh, this specific normal distribution so where where the the betas are independent then you obtain ridge regression estimate conversely uh, we can we can still use the same likelihood approach but instead use a different prior distribution for the betas so if you assume that beta 1 until beta p are double exponential so this is known as a laplace distribution with parameter b being equal to 2 times sigma squared divided by lambda okay so here double exponential because an exponential distribution looks like this okay so you can define a kind of a double exponential uh, show where you divide that by two and you end and you uh, can derive a symmetrical distribution like this so here are these kind of densities here oops sorry I've should be somewhere here so when you take the exponential distribution you divide it by divide the density by 2 and paste it on the negative uh, side of the axis this is called a Laplace distribution okay so you can go on Wikipedia to find uh, the parameterization of a Laplace distribution and when you use beta uh, being some so the the only parameter beta is related to the the speed of the of decay of the exponential distribution then and this other relationship which is the same one that we had before it can be shown that postulating iid laplace betas with this parameter leads to a posterior distribution for which the mode beta hat is the solution of the lasso regression Okay, so once again, the proof is in the exercises. Please uh, go there. Oh, a quick note here. The, 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 the density of the Laplace distribution is given in the footnote here. Okay, so here we can see that the B it corresponds to the, the let's say, the, the, the 1 over the rate of an exponential distribution. Um, and here, so the lesson from this is we can recover both lasso regressions and ridge regressions uh, by applying Bayesian methods to uh, lin linear models so we estimate the li same linear model we had but through Bayesian methods and if we apply a, a, a specific Gaussian prior on parameters then the solution is ridge regression parameters whereas Conversely, if we use another prior distribution on betas, which are IID Laplace, then we obtain the lasso regression estimates. So this gives a third way to understand ridge and lasso regressions. So first we said, uh, I'll use ridge, but it can be lasso also. Ridge can be understood as a linear regression where you impose a penalty on parameters. It can be understood second as a uh, like again an optimization problem minimizing prediction errors where you constrain parameters and third uh, the third way to interpret this is the solution to a Bayesian regression where you postulate a given uh, prior distribution for the betas so this completes the mater material for chapter three uh, I'll see you next time for chapter four have a nice day.